Welcome to paper session one. Uh, how we will be working is first 20 minutes with a presentation and, and then 10 minutes for our lively dialogue. And we will have three presentations and we will start with the first one. How do school leaders enhance professional learning through inclusive networks? And welcome, Linda. Rachel. <laughs> but never mind. Thank you. Okay. Right. Welcome, Rachel. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Can you hear me okay if I'm here? Is that all right? You want me to put the microphone? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I'm not going to sing a song. Don't worry. <laughs> Okay, lovely to be here today. Um, I'm here from the University of Wolverhampton in the United Kingdom and I'm representing my colleagues Tracy and uh, Linda who couldn't be here today. Uh, but I'm also uh, showing part of a, a larger group as this work is a project that was completed from an Erasmus Plus programme. Uh, and that included Milan and Merca, who are here today. Um, and it was a very big project, and I'll talk through the context. And one integral part of the work that we did and the research that we did related to developing an inclusive lens in terms of leadership. So I'm going to talk through that with you today. Um, the big part we were talking about was networks, how we develop networks, what a network looks like. And from the responses that we've got with our participants, they talked about having opportunities to do very local networks and meet in local networks. But the wider network context was difficult. And I think that relates quite nicely to this morning's presentation that we've already had, uh, where we were talking about people getting together, learning from each other, having those experiences. Okay, so our theoretical framework is in place here and it was a survey of over 250 school uh, leaders across Europe and we took case studies from 25 schools. So it did feel that it was quite a, a, a bulky um, report that came through and we did have a lot of data and it took, as we said, across different areas of Europe. So. What we're looking at here is particularly the area of inclusive networking and being able to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to have a space. So what I'd love to know, first of all, is in terms of your part that you play in your roles, just with each other, if you're able to, how you network, who you network with. Is it very localised? Do you get an opportunity to go wider? Obviously, you're here today, so that's a part of a network. But on a sort of a weekly or day-to-day -day basis, who are you networking with? Can you just have a quick chat and then give me some feedback on that, please? That would be lovely. Just turn around to the people behind you or next to you. Who are you networking with? Okay. Apologies, I will just call people back together if that's okay. So what's lovely is obviously we've just networked, which is exactly what we want. So who are you networking with regularly? How are you managing those networks? Anybody want to give any examples of your networking situation currently? Had lots of lively discussions between yourselves. Anybody going to be brave and tell me? Go on. Thank you. Um, I'm part of the. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm currently part of the community that is um, uh, with the headmasters and uh, the principals of schools in the Czech Republic, and uh, this is two-year learning uh, schooling, and this is a great network and a great source of ideas, uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Thank you for that example. Anybody else got an example? No, that's okay. We don't always want to tell everybody. So the sorts of things that we're doing in the UK, obviously similar, we've got head teacher networking groups. We don't tend to have as many networking groups for our members of staff. They tend to go into the classroom 
and they're in their classroom and they don't get an opportunity to perhaps share best practice, to go out and find out what else is going on. And I think that is a problem for us. Uh, the staff in the schools, the teachers, on the day-to-day -day basis, talked about probably the only networking they were really getting was perhaps if they went to the photocopier and had a conversation with one of the other teachers. Um, so we were really looking at how are we going to make sure our teachers have the opportunity to network and how the leaderships give them the opportunities for this. And as we've said, it needs to be in that inclusive lens, allowing them to have the opportunities to reflect, to talk to other people. We know the biggest problem is, obviously, as again discussed earlier, finance. Being able to let teachers out of the classroom to go somewhere else to have a talk to others. Just in the coffee I was just having then, we were talking about sharing practice. So yesterday, going into the schools, how often do our teachers on a regular basis get to go and see what's going on in other schools? It becomes very isolated. Uh, when we looked at the purpose of networks for school year leaders, you can see the graph here, the reasons why they were doing it. Um, so making sure they were developing the curriculum, looking at teaching methods, developing competence. So as you look through those, lots of really good things, but this is our school leaders doing this. So as I say, what I'm thinking is our school teachers need that opportunity to discuss the content and the curriculum and teaching development. So there is an opportunity there that we're missing for our school teachers. What we then looked at was uh, the idea of barriers. What stops us? So we know finance is certainly one. So what is stopping our teachers and our school leaders from being those inclusive networks, being in those inclusive networks? So again, we had some examples this morning where we've got perhaps smaller schools and people are competing for taking children in, in terms of the recruitment. That would mean you're less likely to work with partners, to come together to network, to want to then make your school better by doing something similar. We've also got the situation in the UK at the moment where we are bringing in executive head teachers. So those people are the, the ones taking on a number of schools but what they're trying to do is make them all exactly the same. And they're not looking at the context, they're not looking at the children, the diversity, they're just trying to say, it worked in my school, so I'm going to try and enforce it to work in everybody else's school as well. And I don't feel that's being as successful as we would want it to. So the sorts of things here, how individuals see themselves in networks. So you've just given a really lovely idea in terms of the head, work, uh, head teachers networking. How does that then get shared? How do we pass that information on? How does it go across to our schools? I don't know about yourselves, but I quite often will go to a meeting or go and observe teaching. I see some fantastic practice, and then I think, what do I now do with this knowledge that I have? How do I then get it out there? And you then move on to the next meeting or the next teaching session and that bit of knowledge and that learning has, has gone. You've not been able to share it anywhere. So it's thinking, how are we going to ensure that we have opportunities for people to share that learning? And we talked about the role as a, of, of being an architect. We need our school leaders to be the architect for our staff to be able to give them opportunities to be in, involved in inclusive networks. They need to be able to offer that opportunity. We also talked about removing these obstacles. Again, I was really interested this morning. I wrote down two key words, I think, from the presentation as well as lots of other notes. But there was the, the notion of trust and autonomy. And I think... Again, in England, what we're finding is teachers are not being trusted and not being given autonomy. And this is why we end up with a situation where somebody comes in and says, I want every child to be exactly the same. And they're not trusting the teachers to have that knowledge of the children, to know how to move them forward and what's best for them. And they're not giving the autonomy to the teachers to be able to do that, which I think is a, a, a great pity at the moment. We're also thinking about safe spaces. Where do we have opportunities to go and talk about things that perhaps we might be struggling with? 
Again, you don't want to go necessarily to school leaders if you are a teacher to say, I'm struggling with something, because I'm, that comes very much in terms of possibly, is that going to come back in my performance management? Am I identifying something I found difficult that I'm then going to, going to get into trouble for? So rather than being a supportive network, I'm going to cause myself more difficulties. So thinking across again, I'm going to give you a moment across again where you work your situations. What sort of safe spaces have you got to talk about things? Do you give people opportunities or have you been given opportunities? Just a, just a quick minute if you can have a chat. Where is your safe space to talk about moving forward? Okay. Again, sorry, I'll just bring you back together. Always very hard to stop the, the, the talking once you've set off. Anybody want to share their safe spaces where they have opportunities to talk to each other? Is it mainly that it's just the people that you're working with, where you've perhaps developed a, a friendship relationship and you can have those conversations? Has anybody got somewhere in a school or in their university where you know it is a place you can go to have those safe conversations? Oh, there's a lady behind you coming there. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, cool. Thank you. I am from the secondary vocational school and we have young teachers who very much like cooperating and uh, uh, communicating, but we also have teachers who are elderly and are tired and I don't want to find excuses because this, I know the situation is complicated all across, but every day we deal with uh, new situations we are not prepared for. So therefore the teachers are tired to look for new methods, but we are trying to create uh, or organize workshops. Teachers meet in the afternoon once a month where they can cooperate. Uh, the doors to the principal and vice principal are uh, permanently open. We try to meet them uh, regularly one a week with the hats of subject teams uh, with other colleagues once a month at least in order to exchange experience but it is very difficult to find time at schools where we teach uh, from one to four uh, from eight to four in the afternoon thank you very much thank you very much yes yeah, so key points there i've just scribbled down as well uh, unfortunately my uh, languages aren't great so difference between age groups. So younger teachers coming in are more confident and happy to have those discussions, whereas perhaps we've got the older teachers who have perhaps feel that they've learnt their way, they've got what they're doing, and they're not so keen on sharing ideas and having those meetings. And also time, exactly as we've said, coming in in the morning, going into a classroom, you are busy all day, Having been a teacher myself for 20 years, you don't get lunchtime <laughs> quite often. Anyone who says you're going off to have your lunch, that's always a struggle. And then at the end of the day, marking, doing extra work, planning. So having time to have those meetings. But you were saying there are weekly meetings, there are monthly meetings in place for planning, for working together with heads of schools, with heads of departments, etc. So that does take place. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. So... Some of the barriers that we got in terms of our groups that we were working with and how those school leaders were trying to remove those obstacles for um, networking. So they've talked about their shared vocabulary, which is really useful. And that create, uh, creating a shared interpretation. Again, it relates to this morning's work, where that was that notion of a shared vision. We need to have that shared vision to know where we're moving forward and what we're all trying to do. So that relates as well to what we were doing. Blended learning experiences and having opportunities for safe spaces. In England, again, we've got this attitude a little bit. If somebody comes to your classroom and they're observing, they're doing it very much from a point of view of being critical. 
rather than an understanding that if they come to your classroom, they are trying to learn themselves from you. So we need to perhaps shift that narrative of what the purpose is of going in and observing. Actually, if we can say, I'm going to learn from you, not that I'm going to criticise what you're doing, or I'm going to use it as part of an appraisal process or something like that. And, and wellness. Again, I talked about wellness in the break with uh, another person from the groups here. Um, and we talked about wellness and resilience and building up and ensuring that people felt that they had that safe space, that there was a support for their mental health and well-being and support for their resilience and how to develop their resilience. And this is just how our participants found themselves in the network, that people have similar experiences, they felt they were being empowered to have opportunities to go and see other people and learn from others. Yeah, we'd got some staff reluctant to collaborate, exactly as you were saying, but we shouldn't exclude them. Thank you. And diverse learning experiences. More and more schools trying to be pulled into a network place for the policy purposes, and we're trying to say, does that actually fit for everybody? So, what we've proposed, therefore, is, and I'll leave this one on just to end with, this learning inclusive network framework. As you can see, where am I in this network? What are my lived experiences? What are my personal circumstances? What's the community I'm living in? And then how are we removing obstacles? How are we developing our inclusive lens? Are we thinking about being reflexive? We're thinking about social justice, diversity, equality, privilege, racism. And are our members co-coordinators? Because without people being co-coordinators in the situation, there is no buy-in. So this is what we're looking to move forward to, this learning inclusive network framing and people being able to have an understanding of how they fit and what their role is. Okay, thank you very much for your participation and your comments there in the, in the discussion points. And any further questions, comments? We started seven minutes late. We had some arranging challenges at the beginning and, and then there were new situations when Rachel was having her presentation too, but thank you for everyone's patience there and we have a question or comment here and Rachel I think you will need the earphones again you have mentioned trust and autonomy and I would like to know as uh, in the Czech Republic, it's said uh, that uh, principals have great autonomy. Yes, uh, uh, the autonomy is based in the fact that we also have to cater for the building as such. You have to do the refurbishment, be responsible for it. But uh, autonomy for me is that uh, the teachers have our trust and have the autonomy. But what I would like to know how you gather the experience from learning. You know, how do you recruit? How do you gather? How do you collect? Uh, uh, how do you control the autonomy of the individual teachers? You know, whether the, the individual students are improving themselves, are achieving popular results. So how do you control that? Yes, that question was about autonomy and how we're controlling or developing autonomy um, and how we're making sure that's happening. It's a really good question. And again, we've got to have that buy-in, haven't we, for people to have a shared vision. There's a, a, a very uh, careful balance, I think, probably between wanting to ensure people have autonomy and feel they have autonomy, but also that they are in working within the vision of the schools of the situation that they're learning in. So this notion of co-coordinators, I think, is the most important thing. And we know, I'm sure, everybody in the room from schools, if you're creating perhaps a curriculum, everybody needs to have an involvement in that. 
once you've got that involvement, once you've bought into that and you feel you are a co-creator, then I would hope the autonomy would then come from that. But as we know, we always have people perhaps, unfortunately, that don't perhaps buy in. And then it's working with those people to work out what it is that they're not happy with, what it is that they don't feel is appropriate, perhaps in the vision um, or the, curr the curriculum, however they're working, to work with them. And again, it comes back to probably that trust, doesn't it? Have they got an open, safe space to be able to go and say, this is something I don't agree with, I'm not happy with, and know that they won't then have that as a detrimental respect to them, that they then can have that open conversation. So I haven't got a full answer, but again, it just seems to keep coming back to trust today, I think, doesn't it? Thank you for your question. Uh, my name is uh, Kjersti and I'm from Norway. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. It's really nice. Uh, especially I like the last uh, where you sum up everything and I have some questions about that. Uh, I, what I wonder is uh, how, do you, how do you think that um, um, they should use this f uh, model? the framework yes. with the questions. Do you want them to have a kind of a meta reflection in the group or what, what are your thoughts about that? Thank you very much for that question. Yeah, how are we going to use that, that framework? I think what we're developing at the moment is very much this, uh, we've got a, a care framework that this fits into. And the care framework we're working on includes mental health and well-being includes the notion of being able to talk to line managers having those opportunities to go and have spaces having opportunities for networking so that that diagram in the first instance which I'd, I'd share if i possibly can because i'd love feedback from people on it in terms of is there anything missing etc um, so we're at that early stage of working through and saying this is what we've come together and discussed is what we want so we're moving through now with, okay, how are we going to do that? There are some areas we're really prioritizing. We're doing a lot of work at the moment in terms of racism, privilege, understanding our own privilege. That's a huge area. And I know that's probably not just us that are doing that. And obviously over the last couple of years with COVID, the focus has been on, on well-being as well and ensuring that people's well-being are in place. So the way we're doing it at the moment is we're picking out areas that we feel are key starting with those, making sure that they are holistically embedded in everything we do, and then moving forward throughout the framework with next areas to develop. Okay. Yeah. Maybe time for one more comment or question. If not, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> and if not, then we thank you, Rachel. Thank you.